<laughs> um, well, first, I just want to say congrats because um, Rhoda and I are very good friends, but we also fight a lot, and I thought fiction is the one place we'd be able to agree consistently. I would agree with her in fiction. Um, what I kind of want to draw, not just to your attention, but to the audience. Of late, I've been talking a lot about the environment in which poetry, fiction happens. And I mean, the environment of this room is like on the edge of top tent, you know, yes. really and truly. And that's the power of what the voice can do. I think so. I think it's a testament to that. And we need more spaces like this in the Caribbean for that kind of feeling, that kind of comfort to be there in a room, to engage with the work, and to feel that we could clean it as always. So, congrats. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, thank you. Hi, congratulations on the launch of the book. Can't wait to read it, I just bought it. Um, so, just from the little read that you did here, I'm extremely intrigued to continue the story. I just wanted to say, um, from the film perspective, because I know everybody's probably a writer, but from the film side of it, um, is, there, is there a plan or any intention to maybe take it into an adaptation for short films? Because they kind of lend themselves to that kind of short vignette uh, format. So I do no question. So my, my publisher did like shrug. So um, I guess I'm gonna have to because you know he essentially has all of the rights right now. Oh. So I need to I need to talk to him to find out you know what what is allowed or not allowed. Or, um, you know who adapts and does the things made locally. Yeah. Oh okay. Awesome. All right. So chase. 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 Okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. HBO is buying them rights, and I'm, you know, hot ticket, so you know, try that. Raymond Sand is up in the back there, and, 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 and Frank Hassan. Okay. House Baratheon. House Baratheon. Game of Thrones. 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 And I wanted to say that we have to recognize there's two sides of something here. I'm just being very simplistic. On the one hand, we have tremendous challenges to the notion of civilization here in the Caribbean. And it's all around us, eh? The picture of the naked man on the paper, the different political crimes, the, the violent crimes, the corruption, it's all around us. But we also have to recognize that in substantial respects, and Vladimir, you said it in your own way, Trinidad and Tobago represents a kind of an oasis troubled oasis and a contested oasis and even in this room it represents a kind of an oasis which is to make the point because the two worlds are colliding eh? it's a struggle and therefore it's a very important for the cultural workers and Rhoda you are one of them the cultural workers and the intellectuals to recognize where we are to struggle for reality to struggle for betterment and to keep up with your fine work so thank you for the 10 days executive Thanks. 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 Um, I just wanted to say congratulations to Rhoda. Thank um, you. I look forward to a few years from now coming back to UE for the Barrett Festival. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious, I'm serious. I'm, when I was at UE, I was just the Walker, and I'm like, oh God, we not. I love Walker, don't get me wrong, but I think we needed, you know, new voices that represented what was happening now. You know, because Walker and they spoke for what was happening at that time, and it was relevant. And um, I think Professor Ayajina talked about the fact that the technology and how that is changing how the story, the story is told. And we needed to have writers that were telling, tell the story, how in the voice and the language that we are using now. I so, remember what I wanted to see. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Indra. Thank you, Indra. So I felt that. Sometimes Trinidad writes itself, and I didn't need to do that much. And so if I just kind of pull together how people would say things via social media, that that in and of itself would tell the story, because this place is so fantastical now, and so ironic now that I do even, I don't even think that I need to try anymore, you know. It's just- Yeah, but remember when it gets to me, I would say, where is yeah, the structure? Um, yeah. <laughs> But on a 
final note, um, I am looking forward to the um, Kindle version because I told you I can't buy July, no July. Books. It's gonna be it's gonna be available on Kindle in July for your summer or hurricane season reading. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Any more comments? Kalista. Hi. Um, I find that your stories work on two levels, the micro and the macro level. So you're reading it and you can identify with it as a, as a Trinidadian or a Trinidadian, I should say. And then when you take a step back, you realize that it also works to, to illustrate what's wrong or what's off about our society on a macro level as well. And I'm wondering how hard you had to work to do that. Because it's, in reading it, it seems like, duh. But I'm wondering how hard you had to work to put that, both levels, into the story. That, that, I guess that comes back to the whole split level thing. Um, would it sound really bad if I say not hard? Okay, not, not hard, because I think that, that every, things that work on the micro kind of represent the macro here, right? So a relationship between two people could easily represent the relationship, relationship between yourself and the state sometimes, you know? Because I feel as if um, people who are in a, an abusive relationship, like an interpersonal abusive relationship, could thoroughly understand the relationship between the state and the and the electorate right about now. Because you just feel like, you know, every day you're coming home and getting your tail cut for no reason whatsoever. Um, and you're begging and pleading, oh God, stop now, oh God, stop now. And you keep threatening to leave, but you, you haven't actually left. And so I feel that the, I can just write about the micro and it will reflect the macro. We have um, five minutes, and um, if I um, give the last five minutes, so you can have anything to say, or the reader is short, it's all right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. because, because Jeremy likes this story, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read, I'm going to read a bit from Redemption for you guys. Right, <clears throat> and Redemption is based on where I live in, uh, where I used to live, where, where my mom lives, church and, uh, it's actually Pastor Coffee Church. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not too far from Pastor Coffee Church, is what, in, in what we would locally call a whole house, right? So, so let's go, Redemption. New Testament Revival Tabernacle was only 10 houses away from the Sunrise Palace Hotel and Bar. Redemption, the village in which these two places are situated, is really small. If you lived in Port of Spain, you would say Redemption is pure bush. And the people there are country bookies who ain't exposed to much, and life have a sameness state that could stifle you. So it's not surprising that the closeness of these two places is a constant source of talk. Even people who are just passing through talk about how these two places are positioned. The men talk about it and smile, that kind of cunning smile they have when sex is the subject matter. The women talk about it too, or complain rather with shock in their voices, as if sex and God don't mix. But the real problem with these two buildings is that they know precisely who the patrons are. You might also think it made sense for these establishments to be so close to each other because they had plenty in common. Both places were fully air-conditioned and serviced almost the same set of clients. <laughs> the cars you saw parked at sunrise on Friday and Saturday nights were the same ones parked at New Testament on a Sunday morning. <laughs> and the occupants now making a joyful noise unto the Lord. So it was nothing strange to hear cries like, Sweet Jesus, or Oh God, in both buildings. As folks wrote, Folks raise their voices in a crescendo of praise to the gifts of life given by their maker. The owners of the cars paid their tithes at both places religiously. It was either $40 an hour or one-tenth of their monthly earnings. Either way, they felt it was a small contribution to make for the joy that came into their lives. Neither place really discriminated against the customers of the other. The New Testament pastor, Winston Duncan, had learned a long time ago <laughs> the wisdom of judging not lest he be judged, especially when his judgment started to affect the amount of money offered at collection. Those in the flock who were willing to throw a crisp hundred dollar bill in the collection plate at the end of the Sunday morning service expected and got the indulgence of a blind eye, turned to at least one of their faults. 
Similarly, in his role as caretaker for his own particular flock of sinners, Mr. Faustin, the owner of Sunrise, never turned anybody away unless all of the rooms were filled. And even then, once you are a regular customer, he would organize to clean out a back, back room, especially for you. <laughs>